let's go back to the psychological first aid for this presentation. Uh, but first day of the earthquake, when I was watching the news, I kept thinking we were so experienced in this kind of events, but I realized that we still have a lot uh, to do in the area. I was the first one in the Marmar earthquake, uh, after the Marmar earthquake, and I went there after a week because we were not able to reach the field. And it, it took me five years. I spent five years with the UNICEF and Minister of Education to install the, what we call the psychosocial interventions after the traumatic experiences. So the first day I was thinking, I did all this training and where's everybody? But after that, uh, I kind of worked after the Bengal earthquake and I was invited to Iran uh, because of the earthquake in 2004. Then we worked in Pakistan earthquake. And then Mardin massacre is probably you all know. Then there was another earthquake in 2010. And of course, then there was a mine explosion in 2010. We also tried to help there and one earthquake 2011. And there was a bombing and then more mine accidents. What happens is that when I think about it, these kind of experiences, these are kind of uh, the experiences that we are all influenced. And when I think about it, and I kept thinking, well, we have so many disaster and this kind of experiences, and we are kind of ready. And I was looking at the presentation that I did in 2020. The last slide on the presentation said, we, were, we are very good in all the psychosocial interventions. We know everything. We trained everybody. We, we know it, and we are ready. Or... My question was, are we ready? Because we are good in crisis intervention and are we ready? But when I think about it, I guess uh, we are not ready as we can all see. And maybe we are not so good in the crisis intervention either. But what I like to do in this uh, seminar I like to share some of the experiences uh, from time to time, but the main idea to talk about the psychological first aid, because what we call the psychological first aid is not a uh, an intervention for, you know, like psychological treatment or anything, but something that we all know, not, not only help to people in the earthquake area or someone who goes through traumatic experience, but to help ourselves. Because uh, the feedback I get after this kind of seminars, they say, thank you, because I, I was worried about my reactions. Now I know they are normal. So we will be going over first, what's the traumatic experience? When we look at the traumatic experience, of course, the earthquake, something like we are going through is a big, big, traumatic experience, but when we look at it, even if we have, let's say a traffic accident and somebody we love dies in the car and we survive, it's a traumatic experience too. So we will see the examples, but when we talk about it, either for a person or for the community, uh, any kind of event that extremely da dangerous, it's sudden, uncontrollable, is going to cause uh, us some kind of psychological reactions. Because sometimes maybe we don't have anybody dying in the accident. We don't have anybody injured. But if we are even thinking just for one minute that I'm going to die or my child was about to die, it's going to be a very traumatic experience in that sense. So it doesn't have to be, you know, one person died or 300 people people died or whatever. So when we look at it, traffic accidents, uh, like so many people dying after bus accidents, which we see lately in Turkey a lot 
a lot of times. Almost every day we might see a bus, you know, like getting out of the road and 30 people dying. And hostage taking that of a fellow worker, suicide or normal death, doesn't matter. Chemical accidents, fights, natural disasters, rape, wars, everything. So when we look at all these traumatic experiences, uh, we know that we are going to be uh, kind of affected by these experiences. So which kind of uh, effects we will look at them together? First, on the individuals, but the severity of the reactions, by the way, I just want to uh, go over that. When we are thinking about people usually ask me, Nedret, do you think we are going to recover from this? So we are looking at the severity of the reactions because sometimes people are saying, am I getting really uh, terribly disturbed because my reaction, this and that. We are saying that your reactions are going to be based on the incident itself. You know, like uh, having your car getting out of the road for 10 minutes is different than earthquake hitting 10 cities. The duration and intensity for the community, uh, of course, we are looking at how much they are prepared, what's the leadership and what's the past experiences. And that's how we will be evaluating the recovery too. And the person, how is the person going to be affected? Do they have a past experience? Do they have a personal loss? Perception of the threat or personal coping styles? and or the social support system they have, or any kind of health problems. So when we are looking at ourselves or other people, we should be considering all these. But of course, you know, we have other affecting factors like the physical distance. In this one, I'm not so much agree on that one because the physical distance doesn't matter. We are all going to be affected. Like in this earthquake, People from all over the world are calling me and saying, Nedret, what can we do? Because they are affected too. So the psychological distance is important. I might be outside of the country living in, for example, in the United States. But if I have a family member living here and going through this experience, I'm going to be affected and probably more because I'm not there. I don't know what's happening and all that stuff. And we are talking about exposure time, degree of injury, coping skills, and previous experiences. Going back to the individual uh, effects, of course, we are looking at, at the fact that, like, what's the physical loss? How many people are dying in the family members and friends? Injuries, organ loss, and we will be looking at other things. And of course, uh, right now, we don't know what's happening. And we probably will kind of look at those issues later on. We keep saying, okay, we saved so many people alive, but these people are injured and there is some organ loss in some of them. So they are in the hospital. So uh, depending on what kind of loss we have. Of course, uh, Spiritual loss in this period is very important. Some of us will become probably more into our, you know, faith. And some of us might say, no, uh, I, I'm kind of shocked and I wasn't expecting this. I lost my belief and whatever. Uh, social loss, uh, we might be losing our friends or family members, neighbors. And of course, the problem is here, we are looking at, like, if I had a very traumatic experience, but if I lived in my hometown, in my own house, I could deal with it. But when we have them moving to completely to another city, to another environment, there will be some problems of adjustment too. And of course, what's really important, the emotional loss. and. Because sometimes we say, while, well, you know, everybody else lost their lives, some people are still alive, we should be grateful for being alive. That's true. 
but we are looking at people or sometimes in ourselves uh, like uh, loss of security. We don't feel secure enough and we lose the purpose of life. And we start questioning, you know, what's the purpose? Why are we alive and whatever? Uh, I might forget later, but when we think about the purpose of life and whatever we were discussing with a friend, it's like, and uh, he was saying, I felt like I should have died too. It's like, I don't want to live. I don't want to do this or that. And I said, yeah, but there are two things we can't decide. Whenever, when we are going to be born, when we are going to die. So if we are still alive, that means we have something to do. We have to do something. So we have to kind of find what's the purpose of life. Uh, the psychological effects, this is usually, you know, in all of us, but uh, for the adults, we have depression, helplessness, anxiety, change in sleeping and eating patterns, fatigue, so, slowness, not showing any reaction. We were talking about uh, before the presentation that some of us feel like nothing. You know, we are completely uh, froze, not frozen, but we don't feel anything. And that's also normal reaction. But feelings of worthlessness and missing the person and not accepting the death. And that's another thing. For example, sometimes I see it on the television. It's like the people, the person who are, you know, taking out of the you know, like the rebels, and they keep asking questions. Um, or sometimes they might say, yeah, yeah, you lost your daughter and this and that. That's not a good idea because we will see the steps of, you know, reactions, psychological reactions right after this kind of traumatic experience. Uh, we do not really know what's happening. Uh, we might be aware of it, but not able to react in an appropriate way. So uh, we should be very careful about talking to people who are affected and we have to see in which stage they are so that we can be you know, communicating with them. Of course, we also have the difficulty in concentration, decision-making and unrealistic feelings of responsibility for what happened and the feelings of life not worth to live. Uh, like I was sharing with you, with a friend of mine sharing with me, saying, why are we alive when so many people die? Uh, then, I, uh, for example, the unrealistic feelings of responsibility reminds me a young woman that I work with on, after the 1999 earthquake. So we were talking about all these kind of responses. And it, after the 1999 earthquake, there was a real, uh, you know, heroism. Everybody saved each other. Even people who have no strength to do other things were able to deal with the, you know, aftermath and saving people from the rubbles themselves without people came in and all that stuff. So we were talking about how she felt. She said, I'm the guilty one. I said, what? Because I killed my child. Then I was kind of shocked. I said, did something else happen that I miss? I said, what do you mean by you killed your child? She said, you hear all these stories of heroism. Everybody saves so many people. And I killed my child. And uh, for people who remember the first 99 earthquake, the first earthquake was kind of up and down movement. The second earthquake was from like side to side. So what happened was she was at home in the bedroom. Her bed was close to her child's uh, crib. So when the earthquake hit, the crib left the bed side and went to the wall, and the wall was over the crib. The child was dead. 
So she kept blaming herself, saying that she couldn't save her child and she let her die. die. So uh, right after the, you know, this kind of uh, traumatic experiences, we do have lots of responses that we will be talking about. As a psychologist, when we look at the symptoms, they all seem to be very serious symptoms, but we will be going over them. And uh, these are the responses we see. For example, the first one, we call them the PTSD symptoms, because usually if these last, for example, more than six months or a year, we will have to do different kind of interventions. Uh, for example, re-experiencing the traumatic event, feeling that it's happening again. And I always give the example that because I was caught in the second earthquake in the field, I was in a hotel. Uh, after I come back, and me, I'm kind of joining the meetings in Ankara. And from time to time, I kind of, during the meeting, I sit up and look around and my colleagues say, Hojam, relax, no earthquake. So it's happening like it's a kind of uh, automatic response. And uh, then emotional uh, numbing uh, is one of them. And then symptoms of increased arousal that are not present before this traumatic experience. Like I said, we are looking at the you know, degree of the symptoms decreasing or increasing, and we will see them later. Uh, and we will be, um, I kind of wanted to share this part too, because there is a lot of question is that coming to me uh, after the seminars that I have given before, it's like, what are we going to do with the children? And my answer is always, take care of yourself first. Don't worry about the children. If you're fine, they will be fine. But the parents are so worried, so I decided to share these things. And let's look at the re reactions in children. Regression, dependence to parents. In one of the seminars, two families from the earthquake area were there. And I talked to them before the seminar and after the seminar. Before seminar, they were very anxious. And after seminar, they were so uh, relaxed and we worked on other issues too. Regression, that means a child will start sucking her tongue, acting like a three, four years earlier, or will become very aggressive and agitated, even though he or she is like very calm and a uh, child and will not be ha having an aggressive uh, behaviors before the traumatic experiences. But what happens is that the ch children, when they cannot face with the event that they are kind of exposed to, they kind of go back to the level they feel more comfortable. For example, uh, like they say, they might start their, you know, sucking their fingers, they might start wetting their pants, or they might start prefer to be sleeping in the parents' bed. Like uh, this family was telling me they are eight years old, wanted to sleep in the parents' bed every night because he was worried. So uh, nightmares, sleep problems, um, fears, anxiety, school problems, and everything else. The reason I worked for five years in the area, in the school system, because I do believe that the school system is very important for children and families because of the teachers and the whole system. So we were able to teach some of the strategies to families and um, teachers, and they were kind of taking care of the children for us. Uh, but related games related to uh, repeated games to related traumatic experiences always reminds me the fact that in the Mardin massacre, where 44 people were killed in a wedding in the village, we were there after the massacre to work with the children and the families. 
and we kind of set up a different area with the tent for the kids to play. And before we arrived in the village, they kind of uh, collected all the toys like uh, guns and whatever. So nothing was related to the guns uh, in terms of the toys, even the water, you know, uh, things. Uh, so when we arrived and kind of spending time with the kids, we realized that the kids made guns out of woods and killed each other in the games. Why? Because they are sharing their, you know, experiences because they keep reliving the experience so they are sharing it. That's one of the reasons that after this kind of disaster, we kind of have to spend time with the kids to help them to recover and become stronger for the future. So we do have special, you know, like strategies that we work with them. And after the disaster... 14.48. Uh, what, what happened was that family was telling me that their son who sleeps with the, you know, with the parents, uh, kind of uh, created a song that included that the world kind of became apart and everybody fell in. So the mother was really disturbed with all these reactions in the children. When she heard that they were normal reactions, she was kind of more relaxed. And then, uh, of course, the kids are getting better because I always say parents should take care of themselves first if they want their children feel better so that they can help their children better and then they can all kind of recover together with the, you know, with this kind of traumatic experiences. We should be also very careful with the psychological reactions in young people, immobility, difficulty in concentration, mood changes, sometimes hallucinations. And when young people have this kind of reactions, sometimes we kind of become very anxious and say, oh my God, what's happening? Is there a problem? Because the, the, the young person is hearing voices or kind of imagining something. Because the young person are so kind of affected with this event that it's kind of defense mechanism. We have to kind of keep that in mind. Of course, hopelessness, depression, and sometimes, unfortunately, I have seen it in the past, suicide attempts and substance abuse, especially with young people, and the risk behaviors, fighting with parents and becoming adult uh, earlier than they should be becoming adult. These are, of course, all, you know, related to this traumatic experience. But no matter what happens, all we have to think is that these are all normal reactions to abnormal events. So uh, we cannot come up with the saying that, uh, yes, uh, there is a problem with this person. We have to send for psychotherapy, medication, or whatever. But we have to kind of watch the person or watch ourselves to see how long this is going to be in that matter. So I always say what's abnormal is not the reactions, but the events itself in that way. So uh, we will be looking at the the levels of the reactions, how we go through, and when we are over, over, when we will be overcoming this kind of experience, the shock period. When I think about the shock period, you see it already. Uh, but like I said, I have had so many experiences. I have lived through earthquakes and I have seen so many things. But the shock period was also there for me the first day. 
And second day, I kind of was still there, but I started, you know, uh, moving around anyway. So the shock period for everyone, it's like uh, it's an arousal. As soon as we kind of face the threatening event or threatening object, it's our body's normal reaction to get ready to fight or to fly. But the problem is that sometimes when we encounter this kind of event, we are frozen, just like the woman who was frozen and couldn't save the child. So this kind of reactions happens when we kind of face the danger immediately. So what we say, irrational thinking takes over, not the logical. So I always give the example, let's say I'm living in the early years in the world, it's like I'm coming out of the, uh, you know, my place to get some food. And then I have a huge monster that I encounter. Am I going to sit there and look at the monster, say, okay, Nedret, let's develop a strategy to fight the monster? No, it's an automatic reaction. So whatever we do at that point, it's automatic reaction. Difficulty in decision-making, memory and attention problems, apathy in a sense, not feeling related to anything, not feeling the pain, the pain in that sense. And we have a freezing reaction too. Uh, this is first period. And of course, like uh, what happens is that we are kind of there it's like you see, like after the, some traffic accidents, you see people who are sitting there and cannot do anything, just sitting and waiting for people and, you know, to come and get them and get them into car and whatever. Then we have a second uh, reaction period. After the first shock period, the second phase is anger and confusion. Uh, that it's like fear, anxiety, guilt, helplessness that we are going through at this point. Physiological reactions, we cannot sleep, we feel nauseated. I have so many uh, friends and relatives and colleagues. They keep saying, Nejit Hocam, I feel nauseated. What's got to do with this? It's a normal reaction because we are over the shock. Because first uh, stage, we cannot believe it's happening. It feels like nightmare. You know, it's like something that's not happening. But when we realize that it's really happening, especially, you know, 10 cities, thousands of people, uh, some people will feel dizzy, will have cramps, nauseated. And of course, you know, like drug abuse, substance abuse, avoidance, flashbacks, nightmares. And uh, this morning, one of uh, people who joined my past conferences said, just send me a message saying, I'm so happy that I joined because I thought I was going crazy. Now that I'm happy that these are normal reactions. Then. Uh, in the future, probably, maybe next week or so. Uh, by the way, all these personal reactions will change according to the person, according to the severity, according to whatever. So you cannot say, all right, it's over now. The third period will be depression and grief. It's like we will feel angry and we will miss the people who are dead or lost and we will have kind of depression. We will not be, you know, like trying to connect with people. There will be a lot of anger and guilt. And I have to say that some of my colleagues are saying, Nidret, why are we alive when so many people died? And I always say, well, there is a reason. Maybe there are something that we should be doing. And the thing is like, oh, right now I cannot do anything for anybody in the area, which I do not believe that. I think there's always something we can do. And I'm just so happy that 
to see all that, you know, getting together and trying to help each other in that matter. But uh, the anger and guilt at this point is very important and we should be, you know, like paying attention to that one. And later on, uh, there's the acceptance and adaptation, period. Uh, we will start accepting the traumatic experiences. Probably completely will not disappear, but some of our physical reactions will be lessening itself. There will be going back to daily routines, new coping strategies we will be developing. The experience will be part of our memories, but the time is needed for the rehabilitation. And the most important thing is that there should be a planning done for the future. Uh, this could be in individual level, family level, and uh, community level. We've, I kind of, I'm a psychologist and a clinical psychologist, and uh, I'm supposed to be working with people who are already affected and treat them, but. I like uh, to do the work that to prevent this kind of psychological disorders or to make people strong enough. And I like to share this one, even though it's not in the, you know, it's in the presentation. I always share this and I want to share here too. The biggest compliment as a psychologist I got was after the, uh, missile thing, you know, attacks in Kilis. Uh, I went there with the team and then I said, I want to do a meeting where, where is the place that have the most missiles, you know, falling. They said, it's a school. Uh, it's like every day it happens. So school is closed and all that stuff. I said, I want to have a meeting with the parents in that school. Uh, before I went to Kilis, by the way, uh, everybody was calling to tell me, Nidrit, are you crazy? Uh, the missiles are going there all the time. I said, uh, I talked to them. They are not going to drop missiles when I'm there. So the, when I say this, everybody just looks at me. So I went there. I said, I want to have this parent meeting over there. Uh, they said, okay, but, you know, we have to have a you know, like meeting with the members of the, you know, like the city and all that stuff. I said, yes, only one hour, then I have to go to school. So I had a meeting somewhere in the city, then moved to the school area. I had the meeting with the parents, went very well. And then the missile fell. Not to the place that I had the meeting, but I mean to school, but the place that I had the meeting. So I get these phone calls. Uh, Hojam, you told us that they were not going to throw missiles. So anyway, but after the meeting with the parents, uh, a man came and said, what's your real job? I said, I'm a psychologist. He said, really? I said, yes. You don't look like a psychologist. I said, really, why? You look like a normal person. So that was the biggest uh, compliment I got all my life, all my professional life. And I'm proud of it. Because the main idea here, I probably will repeat this over and over again. When we are trying to help other people, it's not that we will do what we think is the best. But we have to look at what's their need. If their need is like uh, physical needs, we will kind of meet them. If they want to talk, we will listen. But I cannot go to the field and say, hi, I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm here to treat you. And that's some people doing that in the field, which I feel really shame as a psychologist. But the problem is that when we go back, uh, here, it's like family structures are changing, uh, loss of social support. We like to do this information giving too because the families are affected. 
uh, and the loss of financial resources, changing place, family members becoming detached. The reason they become detached most of the time, they have a different way of dealing with the stress or this traumatic experience. For example, maybe I stop talking or sharing my feelings. I don't want to talk. I stay away from my family members while my daughter wants to, you know, discuss and talk about her feelings. And I say, I don't want to listen to this and walk away. So we have different of coping with this event. That will lessen the communication between family members. The other thing is that probably I, I don't want to forget later on. Yes, there are negative effects on family members, but there are positive effects of the family members too. Uh, for example, I know a person who left the family in Turkey and moved to you know another country, did not connect them for years and did not want to have anything to do with them always hated all these family things and whatever. Guess what happened after the earthquake? Uh, of course, uh, trying to get psychological support from me, crying, saying, uh, I don't know what to do. I don't, I didn't talk to them for five years and whatever. What should I do? I said, call them up. They, And he said, what? Call them up, connect them. 1999 earthquake, we didn't have phones. We didn't have the smartphones, iPads, computers. I said, call your family members up. What are you saying? Is it a psychological thing? I said, uh, yes, but please talk to them and then talk to me. So I'm not going to have a session unless you talk to them, which is not a good way for a psychologist to do, I know. But I realized that it was so important for him. He did. Now he's full of hope and he's planning to come to Turkey, see his parents. And, you know, like they, the family became together again. And he did it, not me. He did it. So it's like even though some tragedies uh, make the family fall apart, but some tragedies. Uh, will help the family get together. The effects on communities are, of course, uh, probably larger. And then, uh, for example, what's going to happen after, you know, this earthquake? People are going to lose, they lost their homes. They didn't just lose one house. They lost the whole city. So they're going to be living in a different area. And are we going to have, you know, all these uh, facilities to build the city right there again and everybody will be living together? No. They, they are already started moving to different cities. Not only that they lost their home, but they lost their friends and neighbors. So the whole community has changed. And of course, uh, we are talking about unemployment and feeling of helplessness. An increase in crime rate, you already hear it, you know, the kind of the lessening of le life quality, in a sense. So this is what we will be uh, experiencing, that people will be stressing all the time. Some people will be want to talking, some people will not want to talk. There will be change in the daily activities. Uh, primary and secondary victims, you know, like uh, I talk about secondary victims, sometimes the media is very effective in that one and it should be really controlled. We will be talking about that again. But families will be separating and there will be a lot of psychological problems. Couples will be divorcing and kind of difficulties will be seen in there. Uh, we will be, I just want to kind of go over quickly. These are my experiences from the other disaster. I don't know how it's, it went here too, but similar stages. Uh, first part is the alarm and danger. As soon as we all got up in the morning, 
And some of us got up at night and felt or got the news from the, you know, phones and everything else. People who are asking for help because they're under the rubbles. What happened is that the first stage in the community was, uh, it's a lot of, you know, uh, problems there. I cannot do anything. Feel the vulnerability about not being able to do anything over there. Insecurity and anxiety. This is the, what we call the first stage, alarm and danger. And the second stage, when I'm talking about this, this is what usually happens. I don't know if you have seen this stage early enough in this disaster. That's the rescue and heroism stage. Everybody goes there. Everybody's trying to help each other. We become stronger than we are. Rescue workers will work around the clock with no rest. And of course, there's a possibility that they will be experiencing burnout. That's why we do some kind of program with the rescue workers too. But the thing is, at this point, we are all focusing on helping people over there. Uh, the stage after that is the community sharing and optimism, which I see everywhere. People kind of try to get the help, whatever is needed, you know, like heating systems, tents, clothes, and package them and try to send them there or take them there. So there's a huge optimism and altruism, continuous support and unconditional support kind of trying to make the people stronger over there. Uh, of course, after this will be the stage, the support will be lessened, but not lessened, but kind of start feeling the effects of the disaster and the changes in daily life will be starting to set in. So in the community level, probably what we feel is the sadness. Um, uh, maybe when you're watching this, you know, it's like, are we going to arrive at that stage? I think we will. That's the reconstruction and healing period. Uh, we, we start facing the realities and losses and hopefully in the individual level, family level, community level, we will start taking responsibilities adaptation to a new life and coping and growth we will be talking about later. What I noticed that when I work in the field is that if a person or the community looks at the disaster as a very difficult thing to deal with, that, that kind of personal or community helplessness, then the, the recovery is going to be very difficult, not only physical, but psychological. But if we all view this as a challenge to create opportunities and empowerment, we will develop new skills, coping skills, as a person, as a family, and as a community. So that's what we should be all working together for. And then recovery will be possible. Uh, what's psychological first aid? Why are we having this, you know, conversation? When we talk about the psychological first aid, it's not psychological or psychiatric treatment. It has nothing to do with that or disorder or anything. It's not counseling or therapy for severely impaired people. Uh, psychological, uh, psychosocial approach or support is like support and assist individuals and families, communities after identifying their needs and help them with that to become more self-sufficient. That's why sometimes uh, people do not like me because like in the one earthquake, I was there with a team of four people with uh, with my team and I was there in three hours uh, and then psychologists said we want to come to the field and help you 200 psychologists 
right now, if I say let's go, I think I even have more people. My uh, ex-students, colleagues who live outside of the country, they're all saying, Nedret, we want to come and help. At, in one, anyway, I said, nope, not yet. Uh, 200 psychologists want to come to the field. But think about it this way. If I have 200 people coming in, doing everything, and then leaving suddenly, the community will not be as strong as I want them to be. So usually when we are trying to help, either it's uh, personal support, individual support, family support, community support, what we have to keep in touch, you know, in mind is that, yes, we have to look at the needs and kind of help them to meet their needs. But the idea is not that I want to help them. That's the main idea. No, the main idea, how do they become self-sufficient? So the idea is not what I want to give, but what they need and what is that they have to be stronger to survive in the long term. This is from the Martin Massacre, working with the children. We do have special activities that we do with the uh, children. So the goals in usual psychosocial support, lessening the physical and emotional pain, normalization, informing people about the possible reactions, help them in recovery and coping. The main idea is when either you kind of talking to a person, trying to help a family, help a community, it's like, how can they take charge of their own life? Uh, usually I get this kind of question, Hujam, they are in such a terrible situation. They are so depressed. They are so helpless. How can we do this? I said, our job, not only as a psychologist, but individuals, not to focus on the person's or family's uh, weaknesses or depression or whatever, but we have to focus on their strengths as a person, as a family, as a community. They cannot see it right now because they are in this kind of emotional, you know, like reaction time. But since we are outside and trying to help them, we should be able to see which areas they have, they are strong, so that show them those. So they cannot see it right now, but we can see them, discover it, and let them see their strengths. So the main idea in the psych psychological first aid of psychosocial support is not let's go help them to completely, but help them to discover their strengths in themselves in general. So uh, this is from Elaza earthquake, the thing that we did with the children. And I'm kind of proud to say that uh, when we work with the children or with people over there, it's nice to see, hear from them later on saying that how valuable, uh, even though we didn't, you know, like do much, we couldn't do much in the area. They kind of appreciate that and they let you know. The basic rules for psychosocial first aid is like no therapy. These are all normal reaction to abnormal event. Our job is to help with coping and normalization. And all these reactions are normal reactions from normal people. The other thing that I have seen is that most of the time, after this kind of traumatic experiences, we always think that 80% of the people will be needing psychological uh, treatment, which is not true. If we can kind of help them the way we should be helping, that's what we call the psychological first aid, 80% uh, of them recovers. So, uh, it's not like, you know, we will be all disturbed and needing, you know, like treatment and medication. But if we can help each other in this term, which we are doing already, we are going over there trying to see what they need. And then we are kind of 
meeting those needs. And then also they have the feeling that people are there for them. So it's just a very good thing. And these are individual coping channels. Uh, I like to share that because I have an experience that I always talk about. And people who have joined my seminar before kind of remembers the example. Years ago, uh, one of my colleagues lost her husband. And of course, I immediately went to the family house. And what did I do when I went to the family house? I went to the kitchen and I was in charge of the tea services and the food services. Uh, and older brother of my friend was a doctor. He came in angry, extremely angry, said, Nidrit, you have to come to the living room, see this, you know, this thing going on in the living room. So I go to the living room. Uh, my friend is sitting on in there and uh, people around her trying to help her, you know, psychologically. One of them said, what is this? You're sitting there with no emotion. What is it? Your husband died. You have to cry. You have to cry. If you don't cry, you are not going to feel better. And when I feel, you know, depressed, I cry. It makes me feel better. You should be crying. So trying to make her cry. So what do I do? I run back to the kitchen. That's my defense mechanism. And I say, okay, we have to add some, uh, you know, some things to serve with the tea something to eat, you know, cookies. And then, you know, uh, he comes back, the older brother. Uh, he says, Nejat why are you here? Go to the living room, see what's happening. So I go back to the living room. What do I see this time? My friend is kind of, kind of trying, you know, not trying, but he's kind of crying. Um, Somebody else comes in and says, what? Why are you crying? What's the matter? So what? What if your husband died? You have children left. You have to be strong. Stop crying. And then what do I do? I go back to the kitchen. Uh, what we are doing here, usually, when we are trying to help other people, go through this difficult period, we force them on the coping skills that we use for ourselves, which is good for ourselves. But we think it's going to be good for them too. Uh, everybody has a different you know, coping style. For example, the first one, sharing and changing some thoughts. It's like, you know, I talk to my friend and I say, okay, what do you think we should do there? I think this way, this way. And I, I realize it's not going to get us anywhere. I say, how about if we focus on this one, on the strategy and that? That's kind of focusing on the thoughts. And if there are any negative thoughts, of course, I'm not going to say, no, 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 don't think that way, think this way. I let the person come up with more uh, positive thoughts or, you know, more constructive thoughts. That's one way. But not everybody's the same. Some people like to talk about their express, you know, they, they want to express their emotions. They want to cry. So when the person is crying, I cannot say, no, you should not cry. Because the reason I feel uncomfortable when I see somebody cry and I don't know what to do. I feel helpless. That's why I'm stopping the person from crying. But the person needs to cry. So I always say, you know, if you feel terrible, I think you should, you know, there should be no children around. Go to a room or stay with a friend. Cry for five minutes or ten minutes. Whatever you want. Get them all out. Or help the people to get them all out. Uh, another one is social interaction and support system. Uh, this is the most important one, by the way, especially in terms of 
you know, people, families and communities. Turkish culture is very social, you know, as you all probably know by now. And I have lived in the States for a while. And I know that people in the States are not that socially interactive. It's not more like individualistic to me. It was that way anyway. Uh, but when we are kind of planning the, you know, psychosocial uh, support system, we are focusing on the social interaction and support system because it's really important for us. Even if I'm introverted, I don't want to talk to too many people. I need one or two friends to cry with, to drink with, to, you know, have some time together and all that stuff. So it's very important to put together the family members, like the example I talked about. Even though he didn't see his family members five years, it made him feel so good to be connecting with them again. And the family members probably recovered quicker than anybody else in the area. Uh, when we look at the research done after the Twin Towers uh, in the United States, uh, that was very traumatic experience. Two huge buildings went down. There were some research done afterwards. Even though we think it's a very individualistic society, all the research results shows that social interaction, social support system is the most effective one. So for culture like us, social support system is very important. And we should all know that. And uh, when we are trying to help other people, we also should you know, pay attention to this part. We use some imaginary techniques with children and adults. Uh, something like, if you start thinking about the terrible experience or the details of what you lived through and keep focusing on it, not, of course, you don't want to focus on that, but when those things start coming into your mind, we say, let's think about something better. Uh, most, I'm kind of thinking, how did I survive seeing all those uh, rubbles? I kept thinking, yes, what I'm seeing is terrible, but I'm, I kind of try to picture what it's going to look like in the future. And I went back to the field most of the time, like I was in the area for five years. Then it made me happy to see that, you know, it, it, the places are better, people are better, but it helped me just to think of it. Uh, of course, the physical activities is very important and because it increases the serotonin in the brain and it helps us and everybody in terms of getting over this depression period. These are negative coping styles. I have people that I work with in the you know past in the area, over there, whatever year here in Ankara. If you start staying away from people and activities, not talking to your friends and families, blame yourself or others. Uh, or like some people focus on working. It's a defense mechanism trying to help themselves, but in the long run, it's not going to help. Uh, and some people refuse to sleep or eat and they use, you know, other kind of coping styles. But the problem is, I say, even though this kind of coping style seems to help us in the moment, it's not going to help in the long run. And I always say what we are going through right now is not a short distance running. So we cannot run into the field, do everything, lose all our energy, spend all our energy and everything. And then two weeks from now say, okay, I'm done. No, this is like a marathon run. So yes, we have to do whatever we have to do today uh, but keep ourselves, you know, like uh, in shape so that we can do uh, something in the future.
So it's not like, okay, today is very important. I don't care about tomorrow. No, uh, we have to do everything for ourselves and for people surrounding us. But we have to keep ourselves in good shape because we have a long time to recover as a person, as a family, as a community. Uh, these are the, you know, like coping styles we recommend. Getting information. What's getting information is like what we are doing right now. But getting information, for example, uh, this stress reaction or the reactions we are going through now, like my uh, uh, my friend was saying, it was he good to hear this, that I'm not going crazy. These are normal reactions. Even though she was feeling anxious, anxiety level was decreasing. When she start thinking that she's going crazy, she cannot control this. Uh, she was getting more worried, the anxiety level was increasing. But when we hear that these are normal reactions, then she said, okay, I'm not, you know, uh, in a terrible shape, I'm getting better. So sharing emotions and thoughts is helpful. We say try to eat, sleep, and test regularly. I know that this friend of mine also, you know, working in the field, did not sleep for a week. If you don't sleep for a week, you have everything that we might start thinking you have a psychological problem. So eating and sleeping is not being very, you know, like uh, you're taking care of yourself only. But when you take care of yourself, you will be able to take care of your children, your family, the community. That's why it's important. Exercise and some relaxation techniques. The most important recovery, if you remember the time I start feeling better, was the time I went to see people packing for the earthquake area. That's when I start feeling better. I said, okay, I'm not alone. I, we are not all sitting and getting depressed. We are doing something. That's why uh, taking part in recovery efforts is very important. And one of my examples, like you probably will hear it in everywhere, that I went to the one, you know, after the earthquake in one, I arrived in the, you know, it's like in the area in three hours and I'm working with Kuzlai. Kuzlai uh, started setting up the tents and there, and I'm kind of staying in the area and Kuzlai starts setting up tents and I said, I need a tent. They said, what? What tent? What are you saying? I said, I need a tent. But you always told us that, uh, you know, disaster victims are more important. We should start setting up the tents for them. Now you want a tent for yourself? I said, yeah, I do want a tent. And then they kind of gave me a tent, threw it on the floor and walked away. I'm looking at the tent. It's like in 1999, I knew how the tents were set up. But it's 2011, the tents are different. And it's like huge, you know, things that I cannot even move. So I'm kind of hanging around there and they are kind of young people walking around. Some boys like 13, 14 years old. They said, what, what's wrong? I said, I cannot set up this tent. I'm getting too old and not very strong enough for these tents. They laughed and they said, do you want us to do it? I said, yeah. So they set up the tent in two minutes. And in the meantime, people from Kuzulai felt embarrassed because they just threw the tent and walked away. They came back and they said, Hujam, we want to help you set up the tent. Then they see the tent. They said, you did it. I said, no, I didn't do it. My team made it. And they said, can we borrow your team to set up rest of the tents? Because we have to rush uh, the first day. It's important to get the tents done by night. And those young people set up almost half the tents. So the idea is that we want to help there, we do everything. No, 
you just have to let them contribute to the work over there so they can discover not only like doing a psychological session and me saying, yes, yes, you're strong enough, you can do it. No, they have to discover the strong part and they have to help the others. That's how they will become stronger. So if you help them too much, they are not going to become stronger. This is the well, some of the children activities we do in the field. Let's talk about the coping strategies for children a little bit because the, I know it's important for the families. Spend time with the children and let them express their feelings. Uh, I know sometimes it's scary for parents, but like I said, if you have to cry, go cry in the other room by yourself with uh, your family member, whatever. But when you're with the kids, um, try to be relaxed because even if you pretend they kind of feel you're anxious so they cannot move away from you they will be you know all over you in that way so do not lie give simple and age-appropriate explanation for the event and uh, share your feelings but do not exaggerate take care of yourself first and I always remember here another um traumatic experience that I had to, you know, I I did work with was a young guy, uh, cancer for, uh, for fourth stage. This was years ago, 15 years ago. And family depressed, prepared, you know, preparing his funeral. A wife completely gone, you know, depressed too. And it's like, uh, kind of at the end of it, three-year-old child. So I was kind of playing with her. She said, what am I going to do? I said, what's wrong? She said, my father is going to die, they say. The kid doesn't know what death means. She said, my father is going to die. To her, it's like father is going to leave the house and never see again. My mother is depressed. She doesn't do anything, crying all the time. Who's going to take care of me? So uh, even if you don't, you know, you try to keep it yourself, the kids will feel and then will feel more helpless than you are. So I always say take care of yourself first and then take care of your children and family members and whatever. Like... I didn't know this, too, but it's a very, you know, classical example. Years ago, when I did get on the plane, first time I heard the announcement, I said, oh, my God, these people are so uh, egotist. They think about themselves only, not the kids. So years later, when I get on the plane with my two-year-old, and the plane was over New York and kind of turned around, we don't know if we are going to arrive, you know, arrive to the airport or just fell on the city and then started, okay, now we are going to do this and do this to yourself first, then children. I said, they are right. If something happens to me, he cannot carry me. But if I'm alive, I can carry him out of the plane. So I always say, if you want to help your children, take care of yourselves first. Keep them busy with activities. We do have so many activities that help children. And try to go back to the routine. As, and I don't want to say as soon as possible, but try it. You know, is sorry, it's the second time in that one. So for young people, create supporting environment for them. Let them share their feelings. And... At this period, please be more understanding and flexible toward young people. Uh, because, you know, when the adolescent hits, everybody becomes adolescent. Not the adolescents themselves, but the parents themselves become adolescents too. That's what I kind of observe in that one. So the best idea, encourage them to join sports and social activities. I'm hearing some people are going into the, you know, area 
in trying to set up this kind of activities, which is very good. Help them gain control, return to daily activities. And the best thing, encourage them to help others because that's how they become, you know, they deal with their own reactions and how they deal with the other problems too. The self-help is important because if we do not take care of ourselves, we are not going to be able to help other people. So talk to your friends and family members, share feelings, try to get back to sleep and eating habits, protect yourself and be prepared, not scared. And like, uh, I know some of my friends in 1999 earthquake, like most of them were saying, you know, okay, smoking is helping me or drinking is helping me, fine. But as long as we don't exaggerate it in that way and then get psychological support if it's necessary. And medication is only should be taken if a doctor prescribes them. Help others. This is going to be uh, helpful too. Help other people to understand and experience and control again. Do not think of them like a victim. Encourage others to help each other and feel strong again. Our job is when we arrive, is like in the field, is like, what should we do? Like I said, I distribute tea. I help with the, you know, other uh, setting up tents and other things and po solve the problems and help the family or community to cope in that way. Uh, these are not kind of good idea to do. Do not assume that other people, uh, you know, that you understand other people. Because most of the time the sentence starts this way. I do understand how you feel. You do not understand how it feels to lose five people in your family. So do not pretend or you think you can understand. So uh, maybe you can say, I feel how you, how you, I can understand how you feel, uh, but not in those words saying, I know you feel uh, sorry. I can understand, I can accept it or whatever, but I know how you feel. I'm sure that I'm afraid, you know, aware of your feelings. Do not think that everybody will experience the same way. Every individual is this, not the same. Do not force to talk. Don't ask questions about the events because the problem here, I know that some psychologists are all already in the field and using something called EMDR, trying to erase the traumatic experiences completely. But all I know after all these years as a psychologist, clinical psychologist and disaster responder, if the person is not ready psychologically, anything you do in that kind of uh, level it's not going to erase the memory of the traumatic experiences, but it's going to install there forever. So you're not helping. So the need is not the treatment right now or to, like force them to talk, do this or do that, but just be there and listen. You don't have to be psychologist. Uh, these are the words we don't want you to use. It's like, don't worry, don't cry, it could be worse. You're strong, you can overcome this, or at least you have other children. You know, you lose like uh, two kids in the earthquake. You have one more or two more. You cannot say that to person. Uh, or don't think about the events. Uh, or I know how you feel. You don't know. You understand, but you don't know. It's like... Or sometimes when we get really worried and helpless, we say, let's change the subject. Talk about the football game. No, that's not very nice either. But when you think, when you say to the person, don't think about the event, it uh, reminds me of this funny thing. If I say to you, all right, I'm going to hide this pencil. Don't even think about it. All of you will start thinking, why is Nedrit hiding the pen? Pencil. 
what's written on it, what's the importance. So people do not do that to us, but sometimes we do that to ourselves. We say to ourselves, Nejit, don't think about it. Don't think about it. It's not good for you. This is helping? No, because by, by putting the emphasis on don't think about it, don't think about it, brain focuses on it more, makes us more tired. So uh, instead of doing that, maybe we will be following other things. This is like helping each other. Because as the professional, when we work in the field, we kind of get tired. So we do have special things. So such psychosocial prog programs or whatever usually we plan right now or for later, uh, it's like completely we try to understand the individual's family and community there and make them stronger and survive this uh, kind of uh, disaster. Be I know I took too many, uh, too much of your time, but I want to share this part. Some of people will say, Nidrit, isn't it too early? No, I want to share this because I think uh, it's important. We call something psycho post traumatic growth. That means growth that's resulting from, you know, this uh, traumatic experiences that. Uh, in my uh, opinion, and also a lot of psychologists' opinion, is that, like, for example, in this kind of uh, tra disasters and traumatic experiences, 80% uh, of the people will survive without a psychological problem. And when we look at it, people who are experiencing difficulties in their lives are stronger than people who did not have any difficult experience in their lives. So what counts is that how they can cope. They might have difficulties in the beginning, but when they start coping with it, they develop a strength and they are stronger than before the disaster experience. So when we look at it, the, the way we kind of uh, look at ourselves, and how we look at in the interpersonal surroundings, and we discover new meaning of life, new choices, sometimes change in the belief system. That's what, how I like to finish it, is that what I call surviving and coping, uh, being stronger than before is the what to call, you know, like, mm, post-traumatic growth. And I like this word, the what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. And this is my favorite picture because uh, it reminds me that when we think everything is finished and gone, nothing to hope for, for now or the future, reminds us that we can survive and we can help other people. Uh, this is my Gmail address and my phone number. Please take a note. And when you have any questions, please feel free to call. Some people say, no, 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 we, we don't want to, you know, interrupt your life, work, whatever. That's not possible because when I'm in a session, when I'm uh, online in seminar, I have other things. I will not look at my phone because it's in quiet and in the room most of the time. But when I open it, I will return to everyone. Thank you very much for your patience.